This is Jeremy Clark of JeremyBytes.com, and today we're going to continue our conversation about Lambda expressions and link. Last time we took a look at what Lambda expressions are and the different syntactic variations that we have with those. Today we'll be looking at the link methods. Specifically, we'll be demystifying the signatures that we see when we look at the documentation for link methods. Now link, language integrated query, is really awesome, and there's a couple different ways that we can use this technology. When we build link statements using query syntax, it looks a lot like a query we would use against a SQL database. This syntax is very approachable, but unfortunately the number of keywords are limited. The other way that we can use link is using what's known as the fluent syntax. This is where we use the link extension methods directly in our code. Now personally I prefer the fluent syntax, and one reason for that is we get access to all of the extension methods that we have available to us in link. Now one of the problems that we have when we use the fluent syntax is figuring out how to use the methods. If we look in the documentation, we see something that looks like this. And our first reaction is to just back away from this slowly. It has a lot of pieces. But once we understand what those pieces are, it's not very hard to interact with this method. Now a few common things that we'll see is that we're dealing with I enumerable in most of our situations. Now I enumerable is just an interface that describes an iteration, something that we can step through one item at a time. Now it turns out pretty much every built-in collection in .NET implements the I enumerable interface, which means we can use these methods on almost every collection that we come across. Now something else that we'll see in link methods are generic type parameters. We will see these everywhere. But once we figure out how these generic type parameters are related, it's not very difficult to figure out how to use them in this code. Another cool thing about these link methods is they are extension methods. And we can tell this by looking at the this keyword that we have on the first parameter. Now extension methods allow us to add methods as if we were extending the class itself. But in reality, we're just doing a little bit of compiler trickery here. If you want some more information on extension methods, I do have another video on my channel that explains them. Now the other thing that we'll run into is func. Func is a built-in delegate type in .NET. And again, the first time we see these, they look a little cryptic, but once we figure out what this really means, they're pretty easy to work with. If you want some more details on how to work with func of t and action of t, you can check out my other series on c -sharp delegates. Specifically, episode 2 is all about getting funky and understanding how this built-in delegate works. Now when we're working with link, I always treat func as a big flashing sign that says put your lambda expression here. When we have a func, it's telling us to stick a delegate in here. And as we learned last time, we can use lambda expressions as anonymous delegates. And so that's what we'll be doing in our code. So now let's jump back to our code and look at these things one at a time to get a good handle on how they work. So here we are in Visual Studio and our code is exactly the way that we left it last time. So let's run our application to see what we have. So right now if I click the refresh button, we do get data out of our library. And if I click on an item, we do see that the selected item shows up in the top right corner of our screen. Now we do have some other elements here as well. Specifically, we have a section for filtering and we have a section for sorting. So what we're going to do is we're going to use link to implement both of these. And for this, we're gonna start out with filtering, and for that, we're going to wanna to look at our link methods. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up help and take a look at I enumerable of T. So if we select I enumerable of T, what we'll see is the interface itself only has one method called get enumerator. And this is how the iterations work when we use I enumerable. But what's more important to us are the extension methods. These give us a lot of options for interacting with our data. And we can see we have things like aggregations, averages, selecting particular items, copying, getting counts. The list just goes on and on. Now I would recommend at some point that you take a look through all of these extension methods that we have on I enumerable because what you'll find is there's a lot of very useful things that you didn't know about. Now the one that we want right now is way down at the bottom, and it's this where method that we have right here. So let's click into this and look at the method signature. Now this is the same signature that we saw on the slide. So we see that we have where of t source. 
Now, in our case, we're dealing with a collection of person objects. So everywhere that we see T source in this method signature, we can replace that in our minds with person since that's what we're dealing with. So if we look at the return type, this will return an I enumerable of person. And if we look at our parameters, we'll see that our first parameter is an I enumerable of person as well. So we're going to take an I enumerable of person into our method and pass out an I enumerable of person. Now in this case, the value that we're passing out will be a filtered collection. And the filtering is based on this predicate parameter that we have here. Notice we have a func of t source bool. So again, this would be a func of person bool in our case. Now what exactly does this mean? Let's go ahead and click into func of t source bool and we'll look at this signature. Now, as I mentioned earlier, func is a built-in delegate type, but it has generic type parameters to specify the different types. So if we look at this method signature, we see we have a func of t, t result. Now, if we look at this, we can see that t is used as the parameter of this particular delegate. And t result is the return type that's coming back from this. So when we see a delegate that says func of t, t result, we know that the first item t is our parameter coming in, and t result is the type that's coming back out that we need to return. So if we go back to our where declaration, again, what we have is func of t source bool, which is a func of person bool in our case. And so what that tells us is that we need to create a delegate that takes a person as a parameter and returns a Boolean, a true false value. And logically, this makes perfect sense. We're setting up a filter, so we need to tell which items we want included in our filter. And for that, we'll just pass back a true value. Now, one other thing that I kind of skipped over was this that's used with the first parameter. Now, since this is a public static method that's in a public static class and has this right before the first parameter, that means this is an extension method. So rather than creating a method that has two parameters, source and predicate in this case, we can actually treat this method as if it were a method on the source parameter object that we have. So in that case, we would say source.where, and then it would have one parameter, which is a predicate. And again, if you do want some more information on extension methods, I do have another video that's about 12 minutes long that'll show you all about them. Now, one thing that's important here is we take an I enumerable and we return an I enumerable. That means we can treat this method like a pass-through method. So let's go ahead and start using this in our code and we'll put all of these pieces together. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new method that will apply the filters. And again, since this takes an I enumerable and returns an I enumerable, we can create a method that does that as well. So we'll create a private method that returns an I enumerable of person and we'll call this add filters. And this will take an I enumerable of person as a parameter, and we'll go ahead and call this people. Now we do have to return something if no filters are applied. So I'll just create a default case where we return the people object, and that makes our method happy in this case. So let's start off by looking at the name filter. Now for this, we're gonna be comparing the first name of our person object to a value that's in a text box. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to see if our name filter checkbox is checked. And if it is checked, then we're going to go ahead and apply our filter. Now I mentioned that where is an extension method on I enumerable of T. That means we can treat it as if it's a method on any of our I enumerable objects. So in this case, I can say people dot, and notice I have a big list of items here, and that does include the where method. So we can see that this does act as if it were a method on our people object. Now there is a requirement here. We do have to include the system.link namespace. This is where those extension methods live. So if we go back down to our people object, what we'll see is if we say people dot, we have a much shorter list. In fact, the only item that we have is get enumerator, which if you remember from our documentation is the one method that we have on the iEnumerable interface. But if we add system.link, now we have all of those other methods available to us as well. Now the good news is that system.link is included by default in most file types when we're using C Now let's look at the help that Visual Studio is giving us here. 
Now, the interesting thing is that Visual Studio noticed that we're using where as an extension method. So if we look at the parameters, we'll see it only has one parameter, func of person bool. Now, where did that first parameter go? Well, that I enumerable of person comes right before our where method. So for the parameter, we have to fill in this func of person bool. Now again, this is a delegate that's describing a method that takes a person as a parameter and returns a Boolean value. Now last time we learned a pretty easy way of doing this with lambda expressions. Let's start out with a verbose lambda expression just so that we can see all of the elements clearly. So we'll start out with a parameter of type person called person, and then we'll use the goes to operator, and then we'll return a true false value. So in this case, we'll say person.firstName compare equal to name text box dot text. So we're going to be checking the value in our text box against the first name property of our person object. If it matches, this will return true and we want that included in our collection. Now there is one other thing that we need to do in this method. If we look at where, we see that it returns an I enumerable of person. Well, we're not doing anything with that value right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set people equal to the return value of people.where. Now this may seem a little strange because we're setting our value equal to the output that's coming from our method. But one really nice thing about link is that they're lazy evaluated. That means that this code doesn't run until we actually start iterating through the object. So when I do this assignment here, I'm not actually running any code. I'm just saying if someone starts to pull data out of this object, I want you to make sure that you apply this filter while you're doing it. So now that we have this, we can actually use it where we're doing the assignment to our list box. Now, if we remember our result that's coming back from our repository library is an I enumerable of person. Our add filters method takes an I enumerable of person and returns an I enumerable of person. That means we can treat it like a pass through. So now what will happen is we'll get the result out of our event handler, and then we'll pass that to the add filters method that will apply any filters and then assign that to our list box. So now let's run our application to see this in action. If we click on the refresh button, we get the data that we saw before. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and select John Crichton as a selected item. Now I'm going to check the name filter checkbox, which we see is set to John and click refresh again. Now we see we have filtered data. And notice that our selected item is still staying selected. That's because of the way that we implemented this earlier. Now if I select Dave Lister and then filter based on John, we'll see that our selected item does go away because Dave Lister is not actually in our list box anymore. But if we do select an item and it remains there between the filtering, we see that it does stay selected. Now what we have right now is an extremely verbose lambda expression. We can see this is taking up almost the entire line. And this is one of the reasons why we have all of those syntactic variations on lambda expressions, so we can make them extremely compact. So let's start using some of the things that we learned last time. Now the first thing we talked about was single character parameter names. And again, this isn't a requirement, but it is a convention. Now, when I pick a single character for my parameter names, I usually try to stick with whatever type I'm working with. That helps my brain a little bit when I'm using this variable. So when I'm dealing with a person object, I'm likely to use P as the single character. Now we also learned about parameter type inference. So if the compiler can figure out the type of our parameter, we don't have to put it in. And as we've already seen, the compiler's telling us that we need a func of person bool here. So it already knows that we need a delegate that has one parameter of type person. So the compiler already knows we don't have to put it in. Now another syntactic variation is that if we only have one parameter, we don't need to have parentheses around it. And if we only have a single expression, we don't need the curly braces. And in fact, we don't need the return keyword either. So I can take out both of those. And now we can see that we have an extremely compact Lambda expression. Now this does exactly the same thing that our verbose version did. If we run our application, we'll see that we get the same results. So if we do filter based on John, our filter is applied. But we can see that our syntax is much, much more compact. And again, our P is strongly typed, so it is of type person. And we return a true false value, and that satisfies the signature for a delegate. 
Now I did have another filter there based on date ranges. So let's go ahead and do that. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of parsing based on what's coming in from our text boxes. So I'll create a couple of variables and I won't make you watch me do this. And so we can see here I've created two variables, one for the start year based on what's in our start date text box, and one for the end year which is what's in our end date text box. Now obviously in a real application we'd need to do a little bit more error handling here to make sure that people are actually typing in numbers, but for our example this will be just fine. So what we'll do is we'll check to see if our date filter is checked, and then based on that we'll go ahead and use where to filter. And just like before, we'll say people equals people dot where. And again, we need to put in a method here that takes a person as a parameter and returns a true false value. Now for this, I'm going to start out with a short syntax since we're used to it now. So I'm going to say P and this will be my parameter. And then we're doing comparison based on the start date value of our person object. Now notice this is strongly typed. So we do see P is a person and start date is a parameter on that. And we'll just take the year property on that and make sure it's greater than or equal to our start year. So this will filter out any items that happen before our start year parameter. Now since where takes an I enumerable and returns an I enumerable, we can actually chain these together. So I can say dot where and we'll say p goes to p dot start date dot year is less than or equal to the end year. And this will make sure that we filter out anything that's greater than that end year parameter that we have coming in. Now when we start dotting our methods together, which is very common when we use a fluent syntax, we can see that our lines get pretty long. Now fortunately there's something that we can do about this in C Sharp. The first time I saw this I was a little put out by it, but now I'm used to seeing it. What we can do is before the dot when we're dotting our methods together, we can actually put in line breaks. And this is still valid. So we have people.where start date dot year greater than or equal to start year dot where start date dot year less than or equal to end year. Now you might be looking at this and saying, Jeremy, you really can optimize this. And you're exactly right. I could actually combine these into a single where statement and put an and in between our two conditionals. And that's what I do in most of my applications. But in this case, I wanted to show you that we can actually dot these methods together and create chains of link methods. And in fact, in this case, if we have both of our checkboxes checked, we'll have people.where start date greater than start year, dot where start date less than end year, dot where first name is equal to what's in our text box. And again, none of this gets evaluated until we start using this collection. Now in this case, as soon as we assign it to our list box, it iterates through that collection and that's the point where all of these methods get run. So let's run our application to see what we have now. So let's go ahead and just refresh our items and I'll select John Crichton here. And if I pick the date filter, we can see now we have items between 1985 and 2000. And if I select John, we see that we have our three John elements. And if I select both, we'll see that now we just have two items, the items that fulfill both of our conditions. And notice that our selected item stayed in place this entire time. That's because the selected item that we had was still in our list box each time we filtered our data. So this has shown us the basics of figuring out the method signatures of our link methods. Now that we have this, let's keep going. In addition to our filtering, we also have sorting. Now if I just unfilter all of our data, we'll see that our items are in no particular order. In fact, they're just in the order that they're coming out of our library. Let's go ahead and take a look at our link extension methods and see what we need here. So here's a list of our extension methods on I enumerable of T. And this time we're going to scroll all the way down to order by. And now that we've seen how these method signatures work, it'll be much easier to approach this order by. Now notice we have two separate generic type parameters here, T source and T key. As a reminder, T source is the type of our collection. So in our case, we can replace this with person. So where I see I enumerable of T source, I can replace that with I enumerable of person. So we see by the this keyword that this is an extension method on I enumerable of person, which means we can treat it exactly like we treated the where method before. 
And if we look at our other parameter, we see it is a func of t, t result. But in this case, it's t source t key. Now notice this is called key selector rather than predicate like we had in our where statement. Now if we were to look through the documentation, what we would find out is t key is any type that implements the i comparable interface or the i comparable interface depending on what part of the country you're from. Now all this means is that our object needs to have some concept of greater than or lesser than or before and after. Now it turns out that most of the built-in .NET types implement the iComparable interface. So these are things like integers, strings, date times. Those all have the concept of ordering built into them. So that means if we want to order based on a string, for example, all we have to do is return the property that we want, and that will be our T key. Now if we do have a type that does not implement iComparable, there is an overload of order by where you can add your own comparison. But we won't need to worry about that today because we're going to be filtering based on integers, strings, and date time values. Now one last thing to note about order by. Instead of returning i enumerable, it returns an i ordered enumerable. So this is a different interface that still specifies the iteration capabilities of i enumerable, but it also has the concept of ordering of the elements. So let's go ahead and use order by just like we used our where. So instead of having an add filters method, I'll create a new method that will add the sorting. Now this will return an I ordered enumerable of person, and we'll call this add sort, and it will take an I enumerable of person as a parameter. Now in our other method, we just returned our incoming object as the default state, but we can't actually do that here because people is an I enumerable, and this is actually expecting an I ordered enumerable as a return value. So what that means is we need to come up with a default sort. Now in our case, let's go ahead and sort by the last name. So what I'll say is people.orderby, and then notice that Visual Studio is telling us exactly what we need. We need a func of person t key. Now we know from reading this that this means we take a person as a parameter and return a t key from this particular method. So if we were to use a lambda expression, we just say p goes to, and now we need to figure out what we want to return. Well, by default, I just want to sort based on the last name. Now last name is a string, and string does implement i comparable, so this is all we need to do. So when I say people.orderby, p goes to p.lastname, I've specified that I want you to order this i enumerable of person based on that last name property. Now to use this method, we'll do the same thing that we did with our add filters. So I'm going to wrap the add filters in the add sort. Now this may look strange to you, and it actually is pretty strange. In fact, I wouldn't recommend adding filtering and sorting this way in a real application. I'm doing it this way so that we can concentrate on the link and the lambda expressions that we're looking at today. The biggest drawback from the way we have things set up is that if we want to filter our values or sort our values, we have to re-pull our data from the library. And that's not what we want to do in a production application. Now, if you're curious about how I would implement this in a production application, I do have a third project called peopleviewer.mvvm. And what this has is it has a separate view model to handle all of the presentation logic. And in that application, we don't have to refresh our data if we want to apply filtering or sorting. So now that we have this in place, let's go ahead and run our application, and we should see that we have a default sort based on the last name. And in fact, that's exactly what we have. We see our last names C, G, H, K, L, M, S. So we are sorted by the last name in this case. So now let's go ahead and hook up our radio buttons. So if we go back down to our method, we'll start out by saying if the last name sort button is checked, then we want to return what we have as our default. So we'll just return ordered by last name. Now if the first name sort button is checked, now we'll return people.order by p goes to p.firstname. And again, that's another string value. Now we also have a date sort button. So if the date sort button is checked, then we want to return people.orderby p goes to p.startdate. And startdate is a date time value. 
And that obviously has the concept of ordering built into it. So let's go ahead and run our application to see what we have right now. So we can see we have our last name sort is our default. And then if we change it to first name, we can see now we have Dante, Dave, Dylan, Isaac, John, John, John. And if we change it to start date, we can see we're sorted by date. And I can tell at a glance that's the case because the background colors are actually based on the decade. So since the colors are grouped, I can tell that we're sorted by date. Now for the rating item, I want to do this a little bit differently because I actually want the highest rated one on top. And it turns out that there's a method that we can use for that as well. So if the rating sort button is checked, then I want to return people.orderBy. And notice in addition to order by, there's also an order by descending. So this will sort them in the reverse order. So I can say p goes to p.rating. And when we run our application, we'll see that if we sort by rating, we have nine out of 10 stars on the top and four out of 10 stars on the bottom. So things are looking pretty good for our sorting. Now there is one other thing about our first name sorting. We have three Johns in our collection. So what would be nice is if I could do a secondary sort based on the last name property. You can see right now we have Koenig, Crichton, and Sheridan, so they're not in any particular order. So my first inclination is to do exactly what we did with our where statements. So I said where dot where dot where. So I would say order by first name dot order by p goes to p dot last name. And if we run our application, what we'll see is our output isn't quite what we expect. So here we are sorted by last name. And if I click on first name, notice the sorting didn't change. Now my first question is, did I break the sorting? Well, if we look at start date and rating, we see that those still sort appropriately. So what actually happened so that our first name sort doesn't seem like it has any effect? Well, it turns out that order by actually does a destructive sort of our data. So when we say order by first name dot order by last name, that order by last name just completely replaces any sorting that we had before. Now the problem is if we look at our extension methods on iEnumerable, we don't see any methods that will help us out. But we have to remember that we're actually dealing with I ordered enumerable at this case, and it actually does have some extension methods. The one that we'll use here is called then by. And notice in addition to then by, there is also a then by descending. Then by is a non-destructive secondary sort. So this allows us to order by first name, then by last name. And if we had additional sorts, we could say dot then by dot then by. So now if we look at our data, we'll see that we have our last name sorting. And if we click on first name, we see that we do have our first name sort back in place. And if we look at our Johns, we'll see they are sorted by last name, Crichton, Koenig, and Sheridan. And when we look at all of our functionality together, if we look at our selected item, for example, and add our date filter, we'll see that we can combine all of these methods together. So what's happening in this case is we're doing our filtering. So we're saying where start date is greater than 1985 and less than 2000. We're ordering by the first name and then we're ordering by the last name. So we're actually taking four different link methods and chaining them together to get this particular result. So all of these values combine together to create the output that we're looking for. So what we've seen by doing this is that link methods really aren't that hard to decipher once we get used to the different parts. And we've also seen that Visual Studio helps us out quite a bit. So it will tell us exactly the method signature that we need. So for example, here it says func of person bool. So that tells me right off the bat, I need a method that takes a person as a parameter and returns a true false value. If we look at our order by statements, again, we can see that now we have in this case, a func of person string. Now what this actually did is it looked and said, you know what, the last name property that you're using here is a string, so I'm gonna go ahead and fill that in for you. If we look at our start date, we'll see that it filled it in a little bit differently. Now if we haven't provided any value at all yet, then Visual Studio doesn't know the type that we're using for that T key, and so it just tells us T key to let us know we need to fill this in with some type that implements the iComparable interface. So now we have a good understanding of link method signatures. 
Again, the things that we'll see over and over again are i enumerable, since these are extension methods on i enumerable of t. We will also see generic types, and again, usually we can replace t source with the type of whatever objects we're dealing with. And we also saw the this keyword, which tells us this is an extension method. That means we can use a little bit of a different syntax when we're interacting with it in our code. And of course, we spent a lot of time in func. And again, this is just a built-in delegate type in .NET. And in link methods, this tells us where to put our Lambda expressions. So in our where statement, func of t source bool means that our parameter will be whatever type we're dealing with. And we need to return a true false value. And we see that this basic layout goes into sorting as well. So we saw the order by method, which also operates on i enumerable, and it has a func of t source t key. So in this case, we need to return some type that implements the i comparable interface. And order by descending has exactly the same signature. And both of these return an i ordered enumerable, which is something that we can iterate through, but also has its own concept of sorting. So now that we've seen these link methods in action, we should be much more comfortable going through help, looking at the different methods that we have available, and figuring out how to use them. Now one common question I do get is how do I use the join method with this fluent syntax? And that's something we'll be looking at in a later video. But next time we'll be concentrating on the difference between imperative programming and declarative programming. And what we'll see is we can use link to do declarative programming where we tell the computer what we want and not how to do it. And this can make our code much, much more readable. Until then, be sure to visit www.jeremybytes.com for more information, and we'll see you next time.